It's time for the show that comes at you hotter than a 90 mile per hour fastball. Welcome to Blazing Sportscast, your source for all things sports news, fantasy football, and trading cards. Now, here are your hosts, Mike Blazing Belliot and the Bearded Grinch. Blazing Sportscast. I like the ring to it, man. How you feeling about it? Oh, I'm loving it, man. It, uh, it couldn't have come at a better time. Fresh new logo, fresh new name, same great content. I'm so psyched to be back in the studio getting at it. I mean, I always liked coffee and cards, but it also gave me anxiety thinking like when I have coffee sitting next to my cards, it would spill and ruin my card. So I'm all right moving away from the coffee. I'll still enjoy my coffee away from my cards. Yeah, well, you know what? It's it's a great combination of all things that we love. So not only are we bringing the podcast in, but uh, we're folding it into to your baby, and that's the the Blazing Breaks page and the family we've created there. So just an opportunity to to expand things and and add a little bit to uh, the portfolio. And uh, couldn't have been more happy to to get this rolling and get back at it. I know you've been all over me, and and you're absolutely right to embed it with the Blazing family. We're going to talk about that today as we head into our entire topic. One topic, let's see how we do actually stick into that, Chris, but one topic, and it's going to be reviewing the National Card Convention um, that just happened uh, about a week ago, and uh, already looking forward to the next one. We're going to take some time to go back through and talk about this year's card convention. Chris, we did miss you there, man. Yeah, you know what? I was a little bit of FOMO there, but I can't complain completely. I was celebrating my 20th wedding anniversary with my my wife and my girls in Mexico. So, you know, if you're going to miss the card convention, that's not a bad uh, consolation prize whatsoever. But uh, we'll be there next year in Atlantic City, no doubt. So today's going to be a lot of you talking, buddy. I'm really intrigued about hearing your experiences there at the card show. Obviously, I didn't have an opportunity to get there. A lot of hype around it coming off of a year of COVID where we were just kind of suffering through being in lockdown and in our houses. You know, I know the crowds were crazy. So let's just kind of jump right into it. Tell me a little bit about just your overall experience. So what was it like? What was the the venue from the city to, you know, your overall experience there? And then I'm going to draw you with a little bit more of a uh, Q&A session to get some specifics so that we can get some uh, these questions that uh, I've got on the brain answered. So tell me about your experience there. What, what were your thoughts? Well, first, I, I got to go back to the Blazing fam. I got to say the best part about it was actually, you know, we we do the card breaks online. We talk to all these people on Messenger. We can see pictures of them on Facebook, but nothing beats meeting these people in, in person. Now, some of them, it wasn't my first time, but for some of them, people think like I like Chris. Chris Taylor is a, our, our main admin in our group. He does all of our updating and stuff. And people think he like lives right down the street from me. Like, hey, run and tell Mike, you know. Um, but the fact is I've never met him until the national and it was awesome. So I want to give some shout outs real quick. Jason Upchurch from three Kings. Um, he set up the room for us. I roomed with him all week and I'm not always, I, I can come in late and be a little rowdy when we go to these things. So the fact that he let me stay in his room and actually have a bed this time instead of sleeping on the floor, like the last, last national, that was fantastic. But, uh, Chris Taylor, uh, getting to hang out with him all week and just having fun with him. Got to see guys again, like Mike Williamson, um, who goes with his father-in-law every year, got to meet like Mike Cornet and his brother, his two brothers and his dad, four of the Cornet guys were there. And these, if you don't know these guys, these are just guys that have been in our group for a while. Um, I got to meet other breakers like Tom Eady and Matt Miller, who I haven't had a chance to meet, but we talk all the time. So I, like putting a face and I, if I didn't mention your name, it doesn't mean I didn't get to it, but I don't want to go on this long list. I just want to say that those are names that have been in our group forever and they feel like family. And, and yet, you know, you don't get a chance to really know a person until you see them. And I learned that today, guys who I would like, you know, Raz and I'd be like, Oh, he's on my nerves. And then you meet him. Like, I, like, it, it's like, Oh, this guy's really cool. I wish we were closer. So it, the, it gives you a chance. We call it like, there's a difference between a card show which, you know, I've been to many of those and the national car convention. And the thing about it is it, it truly is a convention. It's not just about the show. It's about all the hoopla, all the like extras that go into it. And most of that is going and hanging out with these people. So that to me was the coolest thing about it. And that's why I want to continue to do it year in and year out. Um, yeah, we talk about it a lot though, Mike, you're saying it's, I think the second coming of, of the card world, right? Like you had the, the junk wax era that we talk about all the time in the eighties and nineties. The word community comes into play so much more now with the way that cards are. And I think people kind of 
don't realize that or don't appreciate that is that the, the communal aspect of where the hobby is now to where it was 20 years ago has come so far. And I think that's such an important aspect to your point, being able to meet these people that you see through Facebook and Instagram and on YouTube channels and getting to hang out with them and go to dinners and lunches and, and learn about their families and take things just a step beyond just the card world, um, you know, just continues to create those bonds. And then can you imagine five, 10 years from now going to the nationals and all the, the relationships you're going to have and the people you're going to meet. It's just, it's something that I can't wait to look forward to starting uh, for my first national show next year. So uh, glad you brought that up because I think it's such an important and valuable piece that people just don't realize. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's funny you say it because, all right, so the first day we were there, we're sitting at Gibson's for lunch. It's like, it's like three in the afternoon. Everyone had, or it's actually like three or four in the afternoon. Everyone had finally settled in and we're sitting at this table in the back of Gibson's, which is like just a super nice steakhouse. Right. And there's like, I think eight or 10 of us and there's four or five different break groups between the 10 of us. And then some like people who help out each other. And we're literally sitting there drinking some beers in the afternoon, eating hamburgers and steaks and, and we're literally talking about every aspect of cards. But at one moment, uh, we're sitting there talking about F1 racing. And none of us are big racing fans, but we we're just talking about all aspects of the hobby. And we're engaged in this extremely intense conversation about Formula One racing. And I stopped for a minute. I'm like, well, guys, this is incredible. We're sitting here with guys we've never met before, acting like we are the best friends in the world, talking about things we all love and are passionate about. And it was like, we've, we've known each other our whole lives and you can't, for me, I don't know about you guys where you're at, but I can't do that at home. Like I talk to people online. I maybe have like two people in a 10 mile radius, 20 mile radius that I could even like have a decent card conversation with, let alone the intricacies of the hobby and all that goes into it. So to me, that was that moment where I'm like, I never want to stop going to this. And that's where right there when I realized the hobby is going nowhere. That was the first moment I realized. And we, I didn't even really enter the, we hadn't, the show didn't open until four. So we were kind of eating the weight to go to the first day of the show, the preview day on Wednesday. And we hadn't even made it to the show yet. And I'm already living on a high being like the hobby is not dead. We are not going anywhere. Yeah. And it's those relationships that are going to keep things going. That's, I told you many a time, my wife has kind of echoed it. She's like, it's crazy that some of your closest friends you've never even met in person. And that's really the, the God's honest truth. I always use the, I call it the oh crap test, like at two o'clock in the morning, if uh, you were in handcuffs or your house was on fire, like who's that person that you could call? Um, you know, and I've got buddies here for sure, but, uh, you know, some of the closest people I've met are through this community and I've never actually met them face to face. So just really cool experience. I I'm glad you got to experience it for a second time there. And, you know, I'm looking forward to, to my first one next year. So it's going to be awesome. So talk about then once you enter into the show, obviously it's overwhelming. The, the venue's huge. You, you mentioned it. It's not like a card show. It is a true convention where you've got, you know, vendors, not just selling cards, but memorabilia and services and all sorts of things. So talk me through a little bit about you know, just the overall uh, experience of walking in there, you know, the vastness of it and some of the highlights of the things you saw. All right. So, yeah, I just took you through not even getting in the show yet and you can hear out the excitement around it, but you wait to get in. So this is the first year they sold out of VIP passes. Right. So like the I had a different experience when I went two years ago as I was a breaker there, went in through the back, set up my tables. I could come and go as I pleased even before the show started. But this year it was really a cool opportunity to go in as the show is about to begin. Right. So it's like four o'clock in the afternoon. They're about to open the doors and stuff. And we walk in and we're like, holy crap, is this the line to get your ticket redeemed? Like to just even go on the show. This thing was wrapped like around, around the room. I mean, hundreds of people just waiting to get in. There's also all the dealer, like if you have a dealer badge or if you have a, a, a um, you know, any of the special badges to get in the, the floor is already full with people. And yet there's hundreds and hundreds of people just line up itching to get in. You know, you get in, they give you a bag. They were giving out free masks They give out your like magazine. You get all these goodies when you go in. Um, if you have a VIP pass, you get to go and pick up your like autograph tickets. There's like little uh, welcoming, like I want to call it like a, not a dinner, but like a welcoming event where you can go up and like a couple autograph uh, signers were already there, like John Stunnerud and stuff like that. And they have pizza out and stuff like that. So you get there and I, I, Chris, you've been to the card show. Have they ever had like a welcoming ceremony or anything like that at a card show? No, never. And what's awesome too is I think some of the larger shows, like even in Dallas and I saw one up in Boston, some of the trends, like they're actually having DJs and music and they're making it rather than just a show, they're making it an event there. It's, it's something that's exactly. just drawing people into it. I'm making notes now for next year already. So I've, I just wrote down first note is for you and I to somehow finagle media badges, if we can, for some <laughs> early access. 
I love it. Yeah, that's the, that's the key. Getting those those lanyards with the access passes are your key to not wasting time um, because that's one thing we'll talk about real quick today is like you do not have a minute to waste. I mean, I was there for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and all day Saturday. I booked my flight to get in at 7 in the morning on Wednesday and not leave until like 9 o'clock on Saturday thinking, all right, I'll get the most out of it. It wasn't even half the amount of time I wish I could have had there. So, um, And again, it's more than just the show floor, and we'll get into that. But yeah, you walk in and you're immediately filled with this excitement. And I really want to just watch Chris Taylor, who was with me, because that was his first show since the 90s. So to go from not seeing a card show since the 90s into the national, I mean, to me, I, it, it was shock factor. The first year I went, we went out to Cleveland with my dad for one day. That was a mistake because one day you can't you can't even you would just it's overwhelming for a day. But um, so you get in there, you kind of try to take it all in. Right. And and I mean, this show floor is massive. To put it in the perspective, I was there all those days and I, I made it through about half the show, legitimately stopping wow. at every stand. I mean, I browsed a lot of the other parts of it, but you can have that much fun at the show that it, you could be there all day and still not get to everything. But so the, the, for the visualization real quick for those that have never been like myself, what are we talking? Two, three, four, five football fields. Like what, what, what do you think? I would say it's probably in length. And this is a rough estimate, like two and a half football fields in length. And probably out another two wide. Like wow. there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stands. Some of those stands, you know, eat up. I, I, it's hard to say how many square feet, but I mean, it's massive. It's unimaginable that there could be that many dealers and sellers. And now I'm not even talking about Breakers Pavilion. Breakers Pavilion and the main stage is all the way off into another wing. And like, I rarely went up there only when we got to see Three Kings and Jason do a live break uh, on the main stage for eBay, which was really cool. We'll I'll talk about that a little bit, but um, it, it was just, it's just, it's almost like you could feel the electric when you walked in and it's just a buzz around the hobby. And I will tell you the crowd gets younger and more beautiful too. I will tell you that for sure. Like it's just a different crowd from what it was two years ago. There was a lot of, you can tell like they talk about the sneaker money coming in. That was definitely there, which is a younger, um, you know, I don't know how to say like well-dressed younger crowd. Like that wasn't a large majority of the presence from the, like my experience the first time. And, um, just just a lot of you to ask me about the age demographic it didn't matter i didn't see any like any way to say it was a younger crowd or it was an older crowd it was young to old and the money knew no bounds there wow. were 12 year olds that had gucci um uh what do you call the the fanny packs around their chest and there were just rolls of money in there with maybe like five or six top-notch cards i mean it the money didn't know whether you were old or young in there there are kids making moves at these shows yeah, the other thing you mentioned too, which you know, I do a lot of um, watchbacks on YouTube of of some of the guys out there with the shows like Mojo Breaks and Card Collector Two, and some of those guys and their experiences. And one of the things I saw was there are literally groups of uh, females that go now. I mean, the, the female presence in the hobby is is one that's increasingly growing in their knowledge. And and you mentioned the young folks. I think I told you the story that I was watching about, uh, you know, the the dads would send their kids off to dealers to try to make trades on their behalf and use the you know, the fact that they're little kids to take advantage and say, Hey, you know, have some pity on me and let's, let's make a trade. I'm just this young kid. And, you know, then they take the cards back to their dad. So a little sketch there, but really good to see the fact that not only is it just new audiences with, you know, the females getting involved into it, but the, the young folks, that's, what's going to keep the hobby alive. So, you know, seeing those crowds there certainly is, is good for the hobby and the longevity of it for sure. Yeah. And I will say, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that people take advantage of that, but I will say there were a lot of stands doing cool things for kids, especially when you like, if you were involved in a group who set up there, like I saw some different groups that, um, whether they be breaker groups or just Facebook pages or whatever sale pages where guys would connect with some of their bigger uh, customers and give their kids money to spend or give them like a VIP badge or give them a couple cards from their stand. It is neat to see that it wasn't just about the money for everyone. There were moments where I saw kids getting stuff, but like you said, that's always also capitalized on. Um, and I will say it didn't seem to me that Panini did as much. So when I was in Chicago two years ago, um, they did so much for the kids. Then there were like all these. And even when I was out in Cleveland three years ago, they did so much for the kids. There were free breaks. There were constantly stuff for kids. Oh, kids come over and get this kids. I saw maybe one moment where there were kids lined up for a box break or something like that. Panini seemed to do, there were no silver packs from Panini this year. Um, the line for customer service for redemptions and stuff like that was constantly, it, it was, it was wrapped around the Panini booth. 
So to me, the most disappointing factor of it all was that I felt like it was sponsored by Panini, but they did a lot less than I've seen in the last two shows in my experience. And they, it seems like they cared a little bit less, um, which is a little disappointing because, you know, I think that that now is the time they could be caring more. You know, they've made so much off the hobby. They've done so much to benefit from it, yet they didn't seem to be thankful for all that. So that bothered me a little bit. That, not to get negative, but if I had to take away one thing and say, hey, I wish this was different, it would be that Panini made more of a positive presence at the show. Yeah, I did. The only thing I heard from a Panini perspective was, to your point, the redemption lines where you could, you know, turn in your redemptions that were four months or older in for the black boxes. And sometimes that line got upwards of four to six hours and wait uh, just to sit there. So, uh, yeah, something to take note of. Maybe they'll, uh, you know, hear enough of it to where next year they they make some changes. I'm sure they were kind of excited. And, uh, you know, the redemption thing is an important part of it, you know, as well as I do how frustrating that is sitting and waiting on them. But to your point, if you're going to continue to try to focus on the future of the hobby, then catering to this young crowd is going to be important. So speaking of, of those kind of things, you know, what were you noticing as you were kind of walking around the, the floor? I've heard some varying takes on it. Was it more people trying to trade? Was it more buy sell? You know, what kind of observations were you making as you kind of worked your way through the floor? So the setup of the show, I think they try to do it this way is they kind of keep like all your like vintage or like, like they, they kind of try to categorize the show as much as possible, even though everyone, there are a lot of stands that sell like all cards. So um, the reason I share that is when, when I walk through like the memorabilia section and like the vintage memorabilia section, like old baseball stuff and a lot of the vintage stuff, it seemed to me like it was a lot of observing and looking. I didn't see a lot of necessarily cash exchanging hands. And again, I, I meant to say this at the beginning of the show. As I share my perspective, you might listen to it and say, this is not at all my experience of the show. Um, it's, it's important to know that everyone that goes to the show goes with a different perspective, like a different objective. My objective was more like viewership, just to take it all in. Um, I didn't go with any cards to sell, trade, or um, nothing. wasn't really looking for anything specific to buy. Um, you also go with a different, you know, you go through with a different lens. Uh, my experiences are very different than your experiences, Chris. Like you're, you're more of the buy and sell market. I'm more of the opening up the wax and just getting to see cards I never really get to see at a place like that. So again, if I share something and you're like, oh, I went and this guy's wrong. This Like it's just, we all have different experiences. So when you go, um, you'll probably try to like go with an objective just know that um as i move forward with my my take but one of the coolest things i saw was like the intense pokemon trading that went on and that to me i didn't see a lot of things being bought but i saw near like in the like the back section when i say there was sectioned off a lot of the pokemon stuff was near like this back section and again it's scattered throughout but this was some of the bigger tables and i saw um, a lot of younger kids and i'm not talking just like seven eight year olds i'm talking like 12 to 18 year olds with binders of really nice and in binders, which is really cool, flipping through binder pages and actually swapping cards like, oh, I need that one for this. I need that one for this. It was like the old school hobby when I was a kid, you know, like I'll trade you this for this, this for this and, and setting up trades. That to me got me so excited to watch. And it showed me that Pokemon is still super active. We haven't seen it as much since the quote unquote flippers like flipper mm -hmm. market has died down. And since the Walmart raids have, have vanished a little bit and we see a lot more of that stuff hitting the shelves, but the Pokemon market, believe it or not, is still super alive and that was really cool to me um and as far as like um buying and selling and trading i think it was just kind of scattered throughout although what you get to see at the national that you don't get to normally see in person is like 30 000, 30k deals being made like wire right. transfers of 35k for a single luca card um so, you know you uh i think it was mike williamson that shared it i wasn't there firsthand but he's like i saw a young guy walk up to a dealer said i have this it, it's a Luca. It's selling for 37 K. Um, I, I I'll take 34 for it. And he's like, there's no way this dude just going to drop 34 K on this card. He calls up on the phone and he's like, up oh, once I, all right, yeah, here, give me your wire transfer number and I'll be right back. And the dude just why like transferred 34 K to me, we see, we hear and see it online, but we never see it firsthand. So if you want to walk around and just see really cool deals being made, you'll, you'll get to see that as well. So as far as like what was more buying, selling, trading, I think the most popular and crowded stands were like your $1, $5 and $10 boxes. So, and the reason being is that's the common collector. Most of us don't have 10, 20, 30 K to drop on a card, even though there were plenty of cards to buy there for that. They were out in the open to, to see the, a buddy of mine had a stand there. And every time I went to his stand, there were no less than 25 people scavenging through his wow. boxes. $1 game used jerseys, $5 game used jerseys. And it didn't even have to be newer players. A lot of these were like, you know, 
uh, cards from five, 10 years ago, you know, your 2010 to 2015, 16 range. And he was selling mounds of them, $20, $30 transactions on a pile of cards. Um, so that to me was really cool because that speaks volumes that it's not always just about the money making. It's about people adding to their collections or buying cards that you would never pay for online, but you saw them in person on a show and you spent the money on them. Yeah. You just unpacked a whole lot there. A lot, and a lot of it's really important. I think it's kind of good to get to go back and reiterate some of it. We talk about it all the time and we did in previous shows that, you know, there, there's the hobby aspect of it. There's the business aspect of it. People are involved in one part all parts that, you know, to your point, your objectives are going to be different across the board. I like the fact that you were talking about the trading old school with the Pokemon, the true hobbyists, the collectors trying to finish out their sets. You know, to me, that's something that's obviously encouraging, um, you know, people obviously trying to, you know, bump up their PCs and, and do those things. The dollar bins, the $5 bins, you know, those are great opportunities to get to your point more, um, you know, everyday cards to fill out and round out your collection as far as a PC is concerned from an investment perspective. Also great opportunity because you can very easily find 10, 15, $20 cards in those bins. So if you spend $5 and turn it into 20, great opportunity to, to make a little bit there. So, uh, you know, good things for everybody to kind of take away from it. So that was exciting. I know they do offer as well the big trade nights there at Nationals. Um, you know, so that's a great opportunity to your point, if you want to move some of these larger things uh, for some PC action, you know, take advantage of those as well. Yeah. And I, I want to say when I get like, I know it was like all over the place with the recap, like, like kind of what I saw there, but I will say that's exactly what it's like. It is literally all over the place. You can't turn your head and not be, and now I'm ADD, so I may speak just to me, but I, it, even if you're not, it's overwhelming and in a good way, but it's also, you got to give yourself time there because that's how it is. You turn one minute, you're seeing Pokemon. The next minute you turn the left and you're seeing, you know, a deal you don't want to like miss, you know, people record these and put these on YouTube because they're really cool to see in person. Um, but like you said, there are trade nights and that's something I didn't touch on. It was really cool. Like I would stop if I saw a guy open up one other, you know, every, every big baller had of there, a locked briefcase and they'd open them up. And it was cool to catch the middle of a deal. And it could be a multi-sport deal, a couple baseball cards, basketball, football, whatever. And watching them like swap out cards, like, all right, take this one out, put this one in and I'll add $500. And like, it was like yeah. just a, such a cool bartering moment to see it. Cause you can do that online, but seeing that happen in person, there is just something special and unique about it. And it happens everywhere there. So it's constantly happening there, which That's I thought, awesome. but the trade nights, like you said, we'd walk into the lobby of our hotel and this is where they happen a lot. The, the lobbies of the hotels at night are just like 20 dudes with briefcases sitting down there and walking around like its own little mini card show within the hotel lobbies. So that's pretty cool, too. Yeah, that is. Yeah, and you brought in the the fact of the, you know, multi-sport trades, and that leads me kind of into the next thing. Any observations over, like, what were some of the more popular sports and players that were being sought after? I know, you know, coming off of the NBA Finals, you still have, you know, spotlight on uh, Giannis and, and those guys and, you know, some some money to be made there. But the, the market for basketball starts to cool off just a bit. Obviously, coming into preseason with football, you, you start to see some excitement around that. Soccer with the World Cup and some of the things going on uh, with the CONCACAF and uh, those things, the USA just winning the gold over Mexico there. So soccer's big in. What were your observations from a sport player perspective? Anything that was really, you know, taking you know precedence over others? I mean, overall, not one sport stood out to me. I hang around a lot of football people, so I heard a lot more chatter about football. But I would say that Luca was the name I heard roll off the most tongues. Um, it seemed like people were looking for Lucas. They were trying to move Lucas and trade Lucas or get them. So I don't, I mean, I don't know if that was just because it happened to be a name that popped in my ear more, but Lucas seemed to be a lot of what I saw on the table for trades too, rather it be receiving or, or trying to get them. So um, definitely seems to be the guy in basketball to, to approach is Luke. And I would say the difference between him and Giannis is um, because Giannis is obviously someone that people are acquired trying to acquire right now, but I just feel like there's a lot more Luca stuff. Lot, lot, there's a lot more Luca stuff out there to get because the card market was more popular when Luca was out there than when Giannis was in there. There's not as much, you know, Giannis stuff out there, at least from what I've seen and heard. Um, so I would say as far as basketball seemed to be very hot on the trade and stuff, but people were talking a lot about, um, and I want to get into the, like kind of these off brands like Onyx and wildcard. Now that they have these NIL deals, there is a lot of talk about these, like the number one draft pick in basketball, like who's coming up in baseball, who's coming up in football. These college athletes, man, they were on the tips of tongues where in the past they haven't been able to be on, on you know, right. talked about in the card market because until they're signed with these NIL deals, that NIL was a 
a term that was thrown around regularly at that card show. That was probably the newest and most popular thing I noticed at this show. Yeah, well, we're already seeing it. You've got the um, the high school quarterback that's looking to forego his senior year to go into Ohio State because he's already gotten a lucrative offer from some kombucha company, um, you know, to put his name out there and, and do some things. So I think that's going to change not only the hobby, is, but but sports as a whole with, with these athletes being able to profit off of that. And obviously, you know, the, the trading card market is going to use that to its advantage to try to maybe incorporate some more of these athletes into their product. And uh, talk a little bit more about it, because I know you were able to break some of this, um, you know, kind of one-off new rising up and coming uh, product that's out there and, and give us some, some of your thoughts on it and the, uh, maybe some of the advantages that you're seeing from this type product, like the Onyx and things uh, versus, you know, what we're traditionally used to seeing. So um, yeah. So as much as I said, I wish Panini did more, I got a chance to speak with the owner of Onyx and actually go to their VIP party, but Lance, the owner of Onyx and then Ty, the owner of Wildcard, who's the son of the, the, the original owner of Wildcard actually. And uh, of course, set at the Leaf table with Jason. Those like Leaf uh, Pro sets going to be uh, now owned by the former owner of Leaf. Leaf, just my understanding is just got sold off to PSA, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that, but there's if it hasn't been done yet, there's deals in the work, uh, like a uh, you know deal going on there. So like so when you talk about these off brands, Leaf Pro set, Onyx Wild Card, four big players in the game, and. Like the this idea of it's on license. When I was talking to the owner of Wildcard Ty, he's like, I, I always talked to Brian, the owner of Leaf, who said, Stop saying on license because this stuff is licensed. It's just not NFL license or pro jersey license, but it's still licensed autographs, you know. And to me, their their owners at each of them were so much more passionate than you ever get to see from the Panini guys, you know. And we opened some of this wild card mat stuff. Oh my gosh, if you haven't seen the thumbograph autographs out of that yet. I mean, the quality of products like pro set, we just opened up some pro set stuff. Um, I mean, we're pulling out of one box, like names like Joe Montana and Peyton Manning dual autos. And like, these are just cars that come out of the regular box, you know, like Tyson Fury and uh, Jim Furyk. And like, they put together these really nice cars and these nice sets and their owners are passionate. They're excited. They're making, they're signing names. Like Onyx just signed Otani, Griffey, uh, the, uh, who's the number one pick in the NBA draft. Um, Oh, yep, yeah, uh, Chris. I don't have it right now either. But they signed him. They're, they're signing these big names, um, and uh, they're not slowing down. They're making more, and their cards are getting nicer and nicer as we go. So, to me, the way prices keep rising with Panini, and now meeting these owners of like Onyx and Proset, as long as they can maintain a a, a a valid price point for their product, I'm all in on these what I call off brands. These you know non Panini brands is what I would call them. Um, because their cards are getting nice. They're signing the big names. They're getting these NIL guys like Rattler and, and uh, these guys. Um, so, I mean, get on board with it now because it's not going anywhere. Well, and I think we, the point with that is is great because we're seeing it reflect not just in, in the cards, but this is also happening, obviously, in the grading world where you've got, you know, your PSAs and your Beckett that have been the longtime stables, just like Topps, Upper Deck, and Panini are on the card side of things. And then you've got these smaller sort of one-offs that are coming in. They're very customer-focused, uh, you know, customer service-oriented they're transparent, their owners are out front speaking to people. Um, and, you know, they're going to start to be taken more and more seriously. They put out great product, they differentiate themselves in the market, they offer something that the other companies don't necessarily offer. And, you know, I think it's really going to not only put pressure on some of the larger companies to watch out for things like quality control, uh, but it's also going to force them to have to just continually push their own bounds and come out with new creative products. So I think having these companies come out is great for everybody. Uh, it's exciting to see. I've seen you break some of it, and it is. It's a beautiful product. And, you know, to me, it's always been the more the merrier, the more stuff we can get out there, the better. I think there's enough room in the pool for everybody to swim. And I'm not saying all the products, and I don't want to get too much into it. We can do a separate show on like the intricacies of each product. But one of the things I like is these owners, they, they understand they were all collectors first almost. Um, and so they, they don't look at it necessarily as a single-minded financial approach, which I think Panini has really started to gear their thoughts towards what can our bottom line look like so we can sell our company for like a you know bajillion dollars. Um, like Wildcard, he developed a 22-player checklist of like the top 22 players from the draft. So or close to it. So there's no junk in it, you know. Um, and and to me, like people are like, oh yeah, but I'd rather pay the extra for Panini. But you can open a whole case of Panini and maybe get one or two of those top names in a case 
or those top quarterbacks, when you're opening these wild cards, yeah, you're paying more or, or these like Onyx or Pro Set, you're paying more, but you're getting the quality stuff out of it. And and that was what like the owner of each place I spoke with was passionate about. We want to make sure we're putting the quality stuff in there for you. So um, they get it. They're, they're approaching it saying we want the collectors to really get their money's worth out of this. And the way I approach my breaks and I do my breaks I, I, or, or set up my mixers, I always say, I want to make sure I'm putting together stuff where I feel like you at least have a chance to be successful at this, you know, and, and yep. uh, Panini continues to make that harder and harder, but these off brands, these, these non Panini brands continue to like make it easier for us to do that. Man, sounds good. So the future of the hobby from that perspective uh, certainly seems bright before we kind of wrap things up. And, and I do want to get your opinions on based off of what you saw there, where you think the future of the hobby is going. And uh, I think you've dropped some hints that, that it's uh, going in the right direction. Um, this is kind of like Las Vegas, right? I have a buddy that goes to Las Vegas and he doesn't gamble, but there's enough things going on outside of the gambling where he can go on rides and shows. There's a lot going on at nationals that people don't see. You watch, you know, vlogs on YouTube all the time, and it's all about the cards and the interaction. There's a lot more going on behind the scenes. I know you had an opportunity to be at a VIP party. You got to, you know, rub elbows with Frank Gore and talk a little uh, Bill's backfield. So tell me a little bit about the non-card experience and what that's like so people can get a flavor for that. Yeah, we, we actually went to the Onyx VIP party at Dave and Buster's, which was really cool because I was able to get my kids like uh, while I was away, get a little gift for them there. So I didn't have to go shopping <laughs> for them, which is just a little added bonus. Um, but no, uh, I, I was it was funny because the players, the, the, the guests at the VIP party was and these are the experiences you, you can have the choice to do. You could buy a ticket to this. Anyone could do it. Um, and they'll have these more and more. I think, like you said, the more and more these shows progress, the more the, these parties will exist. But um, the, the, the athletes at the VIP party were Frank Gore, Chad Johnson, Ochocinco, Randy Johnson. And there was another baseball player. I did. I wasn't, I don't even know his name. He didn't actually circulate much, but I'm sitting there. Like, I think I see a guy that's playing hot shot that I knew from the night before. So I go up to talk to him. He's like, I was like, how was your night last night? He's like, Oh, I just got here. And then he kept saying, Frank, I'm going to get you this game. Frank, I look over and the Frank Gore standing right to my left. Right. <laughs> And he's so much shorter than I would have imagined. But I mean, the dude's chiseled, chiseled. Like when you go to like a Foot Locker or a Foot Action, you see the mannequins and yeah. they have like the, the stuff on that make their arms look all jacked up. You know, they're jacked up. This everything's tight. He looked like a mannequin from like a Foot Locker or like you know an Under Armour store. And I'm like, he just chiseled out. And I realized I'm playing hot shot next to Frank Gore. So you know, naturally, I try to maintain my composure and not freak out because he got <laughs> he played for the Bills. He's he's what third ever in the history of running backs for yardage. Like he's the yeah. man. So he's like, but like, he starts like messing with me. I beat him like a couple games. He beats me a couple games. We play about eight games total. Then the dude just props up on the hot shot machine and just talks to me like he knew me. Um, we talked about his time. I t let him know I was a Bills fan and thanked him for his time there. And he said, man, he, he gives me a, an on, an on uh, solicited, hey, if you're not familiar with it, that's like the Buffalo, you know, the beginning of the chant. And I, like I said, I had like goosebumps down on my like, pinky toes man like he just like That's made awesome. me experience and uh something i never had um because you know watching a player you watch do your like you know we put so much into our teams so for him to like really like take that with him even though after after his time in buffalo he said the fans in buffalo are absolute best it's electric there but then i said so that was your favorite place you played he goes no way san francisco he goes we grew up there together you know as a team i loved it there talked about is he gonna come back he said, I don't know, man, I'm really debating it. I know I have it in me, but my son's a, a freshman at Wisconsin, I believe he said. I really want to enjoy that. And I, I said, did COVID affect like that decision at all? I asked him and he said, not really. I mean, I did it the last time I played it. He says, I think it's getting easier. So he goes, that's not really on my mind. Um, but he just sat there and talked about, you know, being a dad and he wants to be at home more with his kids, his time in the league, how he enjoys it. He doesn't feel pain at all. He said like he feels wow. good and for a guy that old. No, I'm sure he, he means currently. I'm sure he, you know, gets hit a few more times because he's getting up there. But he looked young as could be, man. Um, so, yeah, talking to him. I saw him later when I got his picture and um, got to chat a little bit more. But what a cool experience that was. And then Randy Johnson, who has like severe social anxiety, apparently. I happen to plant myself at hot shot because I'm like, I know this is where they'll, they'll come around. I guess Randy Johnson didn't want to come around because he's like, how many people are going to be there? He's like, and, uh, and Lance told him like a hundred. He goes, I don't think I can do that. Um, and he's like, we'll, we'll come around with you. We'll have people around you and stuff. So when he came up to play hot shot, he had just been playing a baseball game. Uh, he had like six or seven guys and he comes up and he's like, so, so what's this thing called? I'm like, oh, they call this basketball. 
you know, Ralph, and he's like, so what do I do? I said, well, most guys your size go up and just put it right in the hoop. But you're pretty far away from it. So you have to, you can throw it like a baseball if you want. That might be easier. So, you know, he didn't really even know how to work the card machine and stuff. You know, mm-hmm. it was like taking my dad to Dave and Buster's almost like the first time. So oh, I scan his card. We play like, and so we shoot and then it turns dark for like the bonus round. He's like, I can't even see this thing. I'm like, is it time to call in a relief for you? And he, I don't think he like quite like that joke, but <laughs> I gave it to him anyhow, but yeah, just got to shake his hand, play hot shot basketball. So again, the reason I share that is those are experiences that where else would you have that other than going, you know, to something like the national and, 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 you know, you pay up for those moments. Those are extras, you know, those are those extra excursions when you go on a trip, but yeah. I will say this, if you plan on going to the national, save the money to do it right. Because I went to the VIP party a couple years ago. I mean, it cost a lot of money to go to that VIP party a couple years ago where we met, like, you know, hung out with Ric Flair and the dude from Sandlot and stuff. But they didn't have it this year. And I'd never regret, like, you know, that spending the money for that moment. So if it's possible for you, you know, cut out that soda, put that $2 in a bin, in a national bin, you know, put a couple lists of things you want to do at the national beside it and continue to contribute to that because you will never regret the experience you have at something like the national. So the big question at the end of all that is, did you almost run over any of them with your car? No, I didn't hit any athletes this year. You know, I, yeah, Randall Cunningham wasn't there. So he was safe, even though the you know Valley asked me to do that for him last time, but no, no, nothing like that. I stayed safe. You know, I, I luckily I didn't run into him in a dangerous, we, you know why we Ubered everywhere this time. I didn't nice. have to drive. So, so that nice. was nice. Well, then the other thing we can do, I did watch a uh, sports card uh, investor um, got the opportunity. Steve Aoki had a DJ and gig and he got pulled up on stage and got to, uh, you know, dance while Steve Aoki, who uh, obviously with his, you know, platform is huge into the the card world and um you know so had those opportunities so it's good to hear that you know it's it's not just all about the card so i mean if you need to if you're not going like we we plan to go with a group of buddies maybe rent a house and kind of hang out but you know make it a family affair if you want to if you've got young kids that are into the hobby and you can even bring your wife along there's things to do to keep you occupied outside of it so oh yeah um, i ran into a group there i wanted to say that another guy that i didn't get to mention paul beagle who's in our group he was there with his wife and two kids his his kids had, and this is not your kid's collection. I'm talking like Kyler graded rookies and stuff like that. Mm. His kids were making deals. He let his kids do his own, their own thing. Um, but they all walked around together. I would say that it's not something if your kids aren't into the hobby, you want to take the family to go do because you're going to be pulled in too many directions. Then, yeah. so make sure they're in the cards. But yeah, it is. There is a lot to do there outside of. Um, and then next year again, next year is Atlantic City, so it won't be in Chicago next year. It goes Atlanta, Atlantic City, then back sh- to Chicago. It's already scheduled for 2023 in Chicago. So if you can't, if Atlantic city is too far, start saving for Chicago now in 2023. Again, the hobby is going nowhere. Well, and you need to save double in Atlantic city because not only you're dumping cards, uh, money on cards, you're going to be dumping money at the casinos as well. So uh, start saving for that. Well, listen, I think you've kind of made it clear, but just to get your final thoughts, obviously great show, good time. Uh, You know, again, Hey, I missed it. Um, Looking forward to next year, but the future of the hobby, it's safe to say that it's in good hands and, and going nowhere anytime soon. It's going to continue to adjust. Don't get scared in the moments we did a couple months ago when I told you to calm down. You know, um, our, our our society in general and what's going on with everything from the pandemic to you know the the economy. It's all going to fluctuate, and so is the market as a result. But the passion and the love for the hobby, the amount of eyes that are on the hobby, the amount of people that are buying companies in this hobby and trying to make them better. I mean, that kind of money doesn't just disappear overnight, not not at the volume we're seeing. So if you're scared, you know, of, about the financial ramifications of the hobby, don't overinvest. Enjoy the hobby at the level you feel comfortable. We'll always say this over and over again. There will always be one dollar bins and five dollar bins. And guess what? They're going to be the busiest ones at the national now. And they're going to be the busiest ones at the national 10 years from now, because it's not always just about the big money that we talked about. It's about enjoying it too. I'll be honest, straight up honest with you. Outside of a couple things I brought for our blazing group, our blazing group for a repack project, I spent $85 all for cards that I'm going to start my kids collection with all singles, $1 to $5. And I had, so I spent two hours at one place just sorting through those singles. And I had so much fun going through cards that I have never got to hold in my hand, even at the lower level. So there's always something to do in the hobby. It's not going anywhere. Awesome. Good stuff. Well, it sounds like a great experience. That was a great recap. Uh, for those that were able to go, 
you know, certainly interested in hearing your perspective as well. For those that weren't able to go, if you've got questions, one of the things Mike and I plan on doing is, uh, you know, we continue to ever evolve the podcast and grow as a mailbag Monday session where we'll do some live Facebook and answer your questions. So again, if you didn't have a chance to go to the Nationals, you've got some more questions from Mike that, that we didn't cover on this episode. Go on our Facebook page at Blazing Sportscast, Instagram Blazing Sportscast. Send us a note. Let us know a question you might have. We'll try to answer it on our Monday mailbag sessions. That'll be live Facebook uh, events, uh, along with some other things. I don't want to give it all away at once, but we've got some really great things planned. And obviously, listen, tonight's a big night. We've got the first preseason football game of the year, Pittsburgh Steelers, Dallas Cowboys Hall of Fame game. Uh, It's going to parlay itself really well into uh, next week's episode. I think um, we're going to do some fantasy football 101. Mike's going to drop some knowledge on how to uh, traverse the fantasy football world. We'll give you some strategies, some tips, some things like that. But great to be back, Mike. I appreciate you sharing your experience, and I can't wait to uh, continue doing this week in and week out. Yes, and if this is your first time listening, uh, understand that our show will probably be a much different format. We just wanted to kick it off our our new Blazing Sportscast with this national recap. And, Chris, thank you so much for getting us all set up and doing this. Look forward to guys kicking off this football season and getting this podcast rolling. Show your support. Get on our pages. Comment what you want us to talk about. Message us. Let us know. What do you what do you want us to talk about? What do you like to see the show to look like? Give us any and all suggestions that you have. We want this to be as much your show as it is ours. So be involved, please. Good stuff. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Have a great weekend. And uh, we'll catch you on Monday, Mailbag Monday, our first Facebook live event. Uh, we'll have details on our page. So check it out. Thanks again.